other powers' influence in the region. Uh, let me call up uh, General Richardson, and to interview her, we have David Ignatius, who is an esteemed columnist from the Washington Post. Thank you both. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to interview uh, General Richardson. I am a frequent freeloader in my job as Washington Post columnist with combatant commanders, but I haven't yet uh, traveled with General Richardson, and I, I'm, I'm hoping to. Just a brief uh, introduction of General, General Richardson. She's a classic Army success story. She was an all-America swimmer in high school. She joined the Army uh, after college. She uh, was a helicopter pilot deployed to Iraq. She commanded, I believe, an air assault battalion for the 101st Airborne. She is a parachutist. And if you're wondering about work-life balance, General Richardson's husband is a lieutenant general, and they were both deployed to Iraq at the same time as their daughter was becoming a teenager. So uh, she managed to figure that out and a lot uh, else. General Richardson, um, your uh, command, SOUTHCOM, uh, covering Latin America, is in some ways the most o overlooked combatant command, I think, and that reflects a general a problem for our country, which is that we just don't spend enough time thinking about our backyard. So I want to ask you to, to open our conversation by giving us a, a basic SOUTHCOM 101. What concerns you in your area of responsibility? Uh, what are the problems that are on your to-do list? And how would you define this part of the world uh, and what matters there uh, in terms of national security interests of the country? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, it's really good to be here and see everybody here. So, uh, and thank you for being here for this presentation. Uh, I call the uh, I, I call the uh, our region uh, that uh, consists of the Caribbean, South America, and Central America, uh, but we tend to look east and west a lot, and uh, not so much south. And I call it South blindness. Uh, you know, the uh, we just get wrapped up in east west, and really this is our neighborhood. And when you really think about what that means uh, in a neighborhood, what does it mean to you? And it means that you have friends and neighbors very close by. You have neighbors that you rely on. You have neighbors that you rely on for security, for safety of the neighborhood, right? You're in it together. And that's how I look at uh, the Southcom area of responsibility and this very, very important region. I look at it like the 20-yard line if you want to talk about sports and do a sports analogy. Uh, we are on the 20-yard line to the homeland and to the United States. And our uh, competitors know that. Our adversaries know that. This region is so rich in resources. It's off the charts rich. And they have a lot uh, to be proud of. And our competitors and adversaries also know how rich in the resources that this region is. 60% of the world's lithium is in the region. You have heavy crude. You have light, sweet crude. You have rare earth elements. You have the Amazon, which is called the lungs of the world. You have the 31% of the world's fresh water here in this region. Uh, and there are adversaries that are taking advantage of this region every single day, right in our neighborhood. And I just look at what happens in this region in terms of security. Uh, impacts our security, our national security uh, in the homeland and in the United States. And so we have to be, as part of the neighborhood, we need to strengthen our partnerships. Uh, and Secretary Austin talks about this, the integrated deterrence, and I know it's been talked about a little bit uh, earlier today. But I can expound upon that as well as we go forward, because I think it's really important, and everybody in this, in this room uh, is a part of that. You're a part of this call to action that we need to strengthen our neighborhood and we need to realize how uh, resource rich this neighborhood is and how close our competitors and our adversaries are in the region. 
So we may not be uh, focused on our neighborhood, but uh, another country is, and that's China. Uh, I noted recently that I believe 21 countries in your AOR are members of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is extraordinary. And I want to ask you to first to describe what that looks like, um, what you see as you travel around the region in terms of China's efforts to, to expand its influence, uh, make, make friendships, make ties. And then what is, as Southcom commander, you're trying to do about it? So I say the, uh, uh, China is playing chess. Uh, they have a long-term view. They are setting the theater, which is what we use as a doctrinal term. Uh, or we could say it uh, in layman's terms, uh, setting the table. When I show uh, a map of the region and the 21 of 31 countries that have, uh, have signed on as signatories to the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, it covers almost the entire region. 25 of the 21 countries, there are 25 countries that actually have projects uh, uh, inside of their country, a metro station, a railway, a highway, telecommunications, a dam, uh, very uh, projects uh, under the guise of uh, economics, right? It looks like there's investment in this region. These countries are starving for investment. They are starving uh, for having uh, and showing that they are delivering for their people. COVID has really uh, made a tremendous impact and had a tremendous impact negatively uh, on this region. 22 million people uh, into poverty as a result. They've uh, suffered a uh, huge uh, proportion of the deaths, the world COVID deaths. And so these, uh, these governments are trying to deliver for their people. People are getting impatient. And so these projects are, you know, when they have nothing else to choose from, you know, they're dire to show some progress uh, for their countries, then they sign up for these projects. And as we know, that gets into a debt trap. Loans are taken out, multiple loans in some cases for some of these projects uh, that eventually uh, they either have to pay back or other things they have to give up uh, in terms of their sovereignty. And so it's, uh, it's just, it's a spiraling trap uh, that we see a lot of these nations uh, that get into as a result of this. And yet that's not how the countries often describe their relationships with China. Uh, Brazil, the biggest economy in the region, uh, its biggest trading partner is China. And President Bolsonaro uh, was asked recently about China, and he said, China's a good partner. We don't see China as a threat. And, and I'm, I'm curious um, what you see as a combatant commander that may not be obvious to President Bolsonaro or other leaders in the region that you'd want to warn them about uh, specifically. You, you talked about the problem of indebtedness, but what else? Well, um, as I see, the investment in the critical infrastructure in the region, deep water ports, telecommunications, space, SIGINT, these infrastructure projects, often under the guise of economic and uh, for research, uh, countries giving up 50-year leases uh, to put up a space facility. Why do we have uh, the most space facilities from the PRC in this region? In the homeland in China, what are they going through right now? The largest military buildup in history. So one should ask themselves why, when they have this very capable military, are they putting uh, and trying to gain access to critical infrastructure in other countries across the planet. So just to take this one, one more step, and then we'll, we'll turn to other parts of your uh, other issues in, in your uh, AOR. I'd be interested in your uh, assessment of what you see China's long-term military ambitions uh, in Latin America. For example, should the United States be worried about the security of the Panama Canal? Uh, in, in, in immediate, we got to get ready for a challenge terms? Well, I think so. I think that uh, I was just in Panama about a month ago. 
uh, and the uh, flying along the Panama Canal and looking at all the state-owned enterprises from the PRC on each side of the pa uh, Panama Canal. I worry about the, uh, you know, they look like civilian companies or state-owned enterprises that could be used for dual use and could be quickly changed over to a military capability if they needed that too. And so as I look at this, uh, the investment that they make, it looks like, again, they're investing. I look at it as extracting. And so uh, I think we should be concerned, but this is a global problem. It's not just in my region. It's not just in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, uh, this is a global uh, issue. This is the same playbook that they've used in Africa, Asia, Europe. It's not new. We're about five to 10 years in this region behind Africa. But I think that, uh, again, I, I talk about we know what's going on east-west a lot, uh, but not right in our own neighborhood. I can fly to 80% of this region from Miami in two to three hours. That's pretty close. That's really close, if you really think about that. Same time zone, give or take, maybe an hour. It, it is, uh, you know, if we just think about uh, all the things that we've talked about, uh, it's very concerning. And then you just ask yourself why. When you talk about the rules-based international order, I think the, uh, the PRC, China, would like to replace the United States. That is their goal. And they're well on their way to try to do that. But I'll tell you, the power of partnerships in this region, when I travel and I meet with these leaders, I look at them in their eyes, I try to understand their challenges through their lens. How do they see it? Because I know how I see it, and we know how we see things. But if you're really gonna get after their challenges and help them, you have to look, you have to look at it and understand their perspective. I went in, uh, um, one of the ministers of defense uh, that I was meeting with, and um, he had a map on the wall, a big map. A lot of us in the military have maps all the time that we, that we showcase and put in nice pretty frames and everything, and he had this map uh, of the southern cone in Antarctica, and he flipped it around. It was upside down, the way how we normally look at the globe. Antarctica's at the bottom, right? It was at the top. And the southern cone came up in a, in a point. And that's how he looks at the region. So if we really want to understand our partners, we got to understand their challenges. But they want to partner with us, make no mistake. They are hungry to partner with us. And when you talk about integrated deterrence and you talk about everybody here, it is not just Department of Defense. It is the interagency. It is academia. It is industry. It is non-governmental organizations, and I meet with all of them. And I try to put all of the, I use them and uh, look at them as levers. You know, what levers do we have to succeed and put this all together? One minister told me, um, you know, saying alone, we are, we are strong, but together we are invincible. And he's exactly right. But just like what we have, and we've seen the strength of, what, uh, of NATO as a result of what's going on in Ukraine, and we see that power. But I'll tell you that our neighborhood, and what I've described so far, is we really have to be careful about our adversaries and our competitors creating that same type of situation right in our neighborhood and very close to our homeland. So let's talk about the feelings of our neighbors about the United States because they're complicated, to put it mildly. And that was evident um, most recently in June when President Biden hosted the Summit of the Americas. And uh, Mexico, a, a dominant power in the region, significant player, was absent along with some other uh, key countries because they were upset that Cuba, Venezuela, and others hadn't been invited. But it, it surfaced this long-standing, decades-old, century-old um, tension between the United States, this big power to the north, uh, and, uh, and, our, and our neighbors. And, and I'm curious about how you deal with that um, uh, underlying tension, sometimes resentment, uh, and how you think we can begin to, to, to make that better. 
so I'll, I'll, I'll give you Richardson's per, uh, perspective. And uh, as I travel around and I meet with, uh, meet with leaders, and one, I'm very uh, respectful when I go in their country. Sovereignty is extremely important uh, for our Latin America friends and our, our friends in the Caribbean. Uh, I respect their positions. I approach my visit and my meetings with them from that perspective. Um, I've had a couple uh, countries that I've visited, and as we've had meetings through the day, and then we, we might have uh, a reception that evening or some sort of uh, social gathering, uh, I've, I've had a chief of defense say, wow, you're really nice. And I was like, hmm, okay. You should I'm tell him you're an all-America swimmer, too. <laughs> so it makes me think, what did he expect? What did he expect I was going to do and, and how I was going to be like? I want to be their, you know, I want to be their partner. I want to partner with them. They want to partner with us. I don't know what he, uh, you know, expected that I was going to be, um, you know, like I was a big brother coming from the United States that, you know, uh, Again, it's a partnership. It's our neighborhood. You don't expect that from a neighbor, right? You expect an understanding. Uh, you expect to work with them, understand their challenges. And so I think when you talk about the tension uh, and how you have to approach things, it's not that, that we are a big brother. We're a partner. And uh, we have respect for them, and we need to show that. And I think that uh, just as a premise, um, and then that's how you build the relationship. I think that our visits and our uh, key leader engagements, as I call them, uh, are really important. And when we have visitors that come to Washington, they come all the time, then we need to meet with them. And we need to have the right leaders meet with them. Our competitors are picking up the phone. Xi Jinping is picking up the phone and calling these leaders and meeting with them and corresponding with them all the time. And we need to do the same, and I think we can do better in that respect. So to, to ask a heretical question of the Southcom commander, um, should we try to learn a little bit from China? You're commanding a substantial military presence, uh, in effect, this great fleet backed by aircraft, all these amazing military assets. And the Chinese are out uh, investing. It may be opaque, it may have dangers, but as you say, uh, they're engaged in the process of economic development uh, in a way that arguably we could do a lot better. And I'm just curious, because you see this region in a way that few U.S. officials do. What do you think? Can, is there anything we can learn from what we're seeing the Chinese doing? I think the, um, uh, the investment that they have made uh, one of the levers that I use is the, uh, that I found very helpful is the Business Executives for National Security that will bring together um, CEOs uh, from companies and uh, put together uh, a trip into the region. I have one um, that I've worked with, uh, with Ben's on going into Guyana. And why is Guyana very important? Well, they just discovered uh, light, sweet, crude um, right off the shores of their country. And so, you know, that kind of changes the dynamics for them. And you want to make sure that they have honest investment. The thing about the United States is we don't have strings attached to what we do. We don't have fine print. We don't require loans. We don't require if we'll do this for you if you do this for us. We don't require that. We are trusted partners, and that's why uh, folks want to partner with the United States. And so that investment, uh, I think, industry and getting those partnerships. We've already we've uh, already had a another visit uh, in the fall uh, last year to Panama you know, to help these countries understand where they are, what they need to do, and it's transparency, and being able to advise them with no fine print and no strings attached. And I think that, um, you know, that's why I say it's a call to action for all of us in the room, because we've got to bring it together. And again, it's on the 20-yard line. We are in this neighborhood together, and we got to have good partners, trusted partners. We're already a trusted partner. 
We just got to show it more. Uh, helpful answer. Uh, plug for Ben's, uh, headed by former combatant commander Joe Votel, uh, and an organization that, that does uh, a lot of good. So something that's on everybody's mind this week as we read the news, especially from Europe, is global climate change. The, the news of you know, record historic uh, temperature highs in, in Britain, um, I think got everybody's notice. I want to ask you about your dialogue with uh, leaders in, in your region uh, about the effects that climate change will have in Latin America, in South and Central America. Are, are, are people beginning to see um, evidence of uh, impact? Uh, and, and obviously a huge issue that we, we focus on episodically, I'm afraid, is the rainforests uh, in the Amazon. So uh, climate change is very much alive and well in the region. Obviously, the, uh, what impacts the United States will generally come up through the Caribbean. Uh, and so those uh, Caribbean I'm used to saying Caribbean uh, before I got in this job, but our partners say Caribbean. So I always, uh, sometimes I have to correct myself, but uh, in the Caribbean, they are um, worried, very, very much concerned about the storms, what capabilities that each one of the nations has to provide. Uh, we had a, uh, a Caribbean National Security Conference uh, about six months ago and uh, talked about um, getting, uh, you know, what each country has to respond. Uh, last year in the earthquake, uh, the Haiti earthquake, there were multiple countries that had capabilities. They don't have a lot of capability, but they have some capability. And again, uh, you put all that together and then you have, a, you have a strong capability. Nobody has enough to be able to respond and uh, in order to withstand, uh, you know, a strong storm. I could talk about Edna and Iota in 2020. Crushed the uh, South America in uh, uh, Honduras, uh, for example, still uh, have tarps on the roof, things like that. They still haven't recovered for that. Uh, you had COVID on top of that. Uh, you talk about the, uh, uh, the drought corridor that we have uh, that's in Mexico, down through Central America, provides, uh, not provides, uh, causes uh, food insecurity for about 8 million people. So this is very, very much a part of this region. When you can't get food, you can't get health care, you, uh, you don't feel safe, you feel insecure. I could add transnational criminal organizations in there that uh, provide insecurity and instability. It causes people to move. They're gonna go somewhere where they can get food, where they can get health care, where they can feel safe and live and thrive with their kids and their family. And this causes this irregular migration. So very much a part of what uh, our region uh, faces and faces every single day, and we're trying to help them be stronger and counter that. So as, as I listen to you talk about those uh, threats, I, I'm wondering if uh, Southcom and other combatant commands need to have as one of their uh, mission priorities in terms of our national security, engaging these climate change issues uh, on the ground. I mean, the thing about, about a COCOM is uh, you have resources. You can get places in a hurry. You can connect. Um, you know, our, our government as a whole often isn't as, as flexible. Sh should, should we bump climate change and its impact up on our list of national security priorities in your, in your region and around the world? Absolutely. And so climate defense is already uh, a program that Department of Defense has. Southcom has it as a priority, and, uh, and working with our partner nations, uh, making our own forces uh, stronger and withstand, being able to withstand uh, stronger storms. How do you respond uh, and, and make sure you're strong and can withstand the, the harsh environment that some of these storms bring? Um, all of those things we wrap up in there. Uh, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing, for example. All of those things that go into um, uh, and, and I find, quite honestly, that some of these other topics really resonate with our partners because it takes away revenue that they have. 
but it's absolutely at the top of the list. I was very, you know, I wasn't able to, uh, uh, Department of Defense wasn't part of some of the, the Americas, but we were able to participate in a climate, uh, climate change forum the week prior. And I got to be the keynote speaker amongst a lot of uh, scientists and experts on climate and these kinds of things. And I was the only general speaking to this group. And I told him, I said, I bet you're wondering why there's a four-star general talking to you today. Uh, but I got to share all of the things that we're doing in Southcom and the Department of Defense does to help uh, our partners withstand all of these things. And uh, it was a great opportunity to talk about it. But just then, you know, educate and inform. Again, it goes back to all of us working together uh, as part of the integrated deterrence. I want to take advantage of uh, General Richardson's uh, uh, being with us to ask about a, a couple of specific countries that matter but don't often get uh, discussed in the foreign policy gatherings that I attend. And I, I want to start with Colombia. Colombia is a country where we've had a significant engagement for a long time. Colombia just elected its most uh, left-wing uh, president in a long time, I'm going to say uh, decades uh, at least. Um, uh, Gustavo Petro will take office next month. He's already talking about improving Colombia's relations with Venezuela. So I'm wondering, as this new political figure enters on the horizon, you're, you don't do policy, obviously, but I'm, I'm wondering whether from your perspective as, as Southcom commander, these changes in Colombia um, make you look at, at Colombia and the challenges in a new way. I think if we're, um, in terms of looking at Colombia, Colombia is a great new story. Oh my gosh off the charts, the capabilities of their military. Uh, they are an exporter of security. They train other partner nation militaries to be strong. They run, I mean, I'm a helicopter pilot. We used to have the Spanish-speaking part of flight school uh, in the United States at Fort Rucker, Alabama. Um, Columbia took that on in 2019. They train all of our helicopter pilots. That's a huge, great story. Again, uh, you know, as we work with our partner nations, it's about being sincere. We will work with our partner nations. We have a strong relationship. We just uh, celebrated the 200th anniversary of Colombia and the United States. It's this year. And so you talk about the ties that, the, that we have. We fought side by side with them in war already. This is a huge country. It's an opportunity. Uh, a call to action, a call to opportunity. Uh, and we will be there to work with this partner nation, uh, regardless of what administration is there. And so uh, I, have, we, I think we have a lot to offer. And again, it's with no strings attached. It's with no fine print. And we already have a well-established relationship with them. So the other uh, key actor in the region um, that we worry about from a national security standpoint is Venezuela. Uh, and I want to ask you about um, how you'd assess uh, in, in strict national security terms the, the danger that Venezuela poses, uh, and, and, and if, if that's a, a less uh, dramatic danger than sometimes portrayed, I'd be interested in hearing that as, as well. We just uh, had uh, several months ago a uh, decision by the Biden administration to allow, encourage Chevron to extend uh, an oil lease um, in Venezuela, which, which made some people wonder if maybe a slightly different shape to, to policy might be ahead. But again, from your perspective as our, as our combatant commander, how do you assess Venezuela right now? I would say the uh, Venezuela has caused a lot of instability in the region. It's caused uh, a lot of migration. It has caused the other countries around it that are neighbors and some that aren't even neighbors uh, to have uh, take on uh, the migration issue as a result of Venezuela. When you talk about six million coming out of Venezuela and then the countries in Brazil and Colombia, uh, in Chile and the other countries in uh, South America and Central America taking this on. That's, again, I go back to the COVID impacts already and they're struggling being able to provide. And so this is just an added, uh, an added, um, you know, but they're doing it. 
and they're doing it and they know that the reason that they have to do it and they're taking they're trying to take care of the neighborhood and they're doing the best they can but this is an additional challenge that they have to take on and the other countries are doing a great job of this having this resolved peacefully and uh, de uh, democratically is obviously where we want to go with venezuela and um I meet in, Venezuela, or in, uh, in Miami, uh, a lot of the, the different diasporas in Miami, there are a lot of uh, folks from Venezuela in Miami, and a lot of them still have family in Venezuela. And if that uh, situation could be resolved democratically, that's what we would all strive and hope that actually happens. But I will tell you that just on the, you know, again, I go back to when people don't feel safe, uh, they can't get health care, they can't get basic needs, they leave the country and they're on the move. And it absolutely contributes to their regular migration. I'm going to go to the audience in just a minute or two for your questions, so be thinking. This is a chance to ask about, about a region we don't get to talk about off, often enough. But before I do that, I want to uh, piggyback on a question that uh, Courtney Kuby uh, asked a few minutes ago of uh, General Brown uh, talking about the Dobbs decision by the Supreme Court. And uh, uh, General Brown is, is Air Force Chief of Staff. You have, in a sense, a, a more direct, immediate relationship with uh, thousands of people who were part of SOUTHCOM, in including some uh, women in, in service who may, who may be concerned about the impact of that decision. Um, uh, Southcom is based in, in Florida, but it's arrayed across uh, the south and then uh, in your AOR. What, what um, uh, can you tell us about the kind of guidance that you're giving to your colleagues, uh, if any, uh, about how to deal with this, the concerns you have going forward about, about taking care of all of your personnel um, uh, and, the, and their health needs? Yeah, so the uh, taking care of people, obviously, in the, in the Army anyway, the, uh, you know, we're not, we're, we're about people. Uh, the people uh, in our service are really our weapon system. And so taking care of people is uh, extremely important. Uh, as uh, CQ said, the, uh, you know, he's a service chief, and those service chiefs, uh, they train and equip our forces, and then the combatant commanders are the, uh, are the customers of the service chiefs and things like that. And so uh, we have to just do the best that we can based on the, the decisions that are made by our country to take care of our people. And bottom line, uh, uh, the services have to put the policies in place in the department, uh, and then we will uh, follow in line with that uh, as we uh, receive personnel in our region and take care of them. And just, just to take this uh, a step further, um, I'm sure you've gotten questions uh, from, your, from your staff uh, about this. It's something the whole country has been asking about. What do you tell them? Well, uh, I, I think that the, we watch the debates on the news. We see the different arguments that happen. And, um, and I think that the, uh, as the decision is made, uh, the policies will put in place. And, uh, and we've got to trust in our leaders and the policies for our Department of Defense as we move forward. And then we take care of our people. So uh, I hope people have been thinking about questions and have some. I see Jane Harmon. And let me start with Jane. Well, thank you very much. That was very interested, interesting. Glad you made it, David. Uh, first, I hope you'll tell us what happened to your teenage daughter, uh, how she turned out. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm really asking about the southern border of the United States. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas wasn't asked about that much yesterday when he was questioned. I understand that's much more of, a, of, a, of an issue for the Department of Homeland Security. But the pictures and the stories are everywhere, and I have to believe that people in your AOR are very aware uh, of our border policies and some of the confusion and uh, some of the... Uh, uh, personal tragedies and the rest, and I just wonder, what do you say about that, and what activities do you undertake uh, to, if if you do, to uh, uh, explain our policies to the the countries that you deal with? So the in terms of that's uh, 
in some of the things that I described about their regular migration. Uh, and certainly when I was in Northcom in my previous job uh, and uh, being uh, up, up front, close and personal with the Southwest border uh, and seeing the challenges that we have and then realizing that a lot of that uh, comes from now the Southcom region uh, up, to, uh, up to the Southwest border. And so, uh, again, the, what we try to do in Southcom is we work with our partner nations, right, to, to, as they handle the migration problem and they handle inser, uh, uh, internal security problems is to make them stronger and uh, to work with them, talk about human rights, the rule of law, uh, everything that we talk about, train, train, advise, assist, the security cooperation, the exercises that we do, makes them stronger to deal with these problems, deal with their borders, deal with their other uh, neighbors. Uh, as, uh, as, the, uh, as we know, going through South America, if we have migration up through Colombia into Panama and over, they all have a very uh, uh, good perspective in terms of how that translates and how it happens and then how it impacts them uh, specifically in each one of those countries. It's different. And um, so as I meet with them, I, I talk to them about uh, that. But then we also, it's not just about talking about it. It's about, you know, how do we make them stronger to handle their own problems so we don't have to help them even more. And so that's really what we try to do in, uh, in Southcom. Let's take a, a couple more questions before lunch. I saw a gentleman in the first row. Sorry. So, yes. Uh, over by the window. Got to see two of you there first, and then the gentleman behind you. Uh, thank you, uh, Marcus Oliver from the Government Accountability Office. And I just wanted to ask General Richardson, just I guess, what are some of the, uh, of the challenges that sort of you face in managing the sort of Gitmo mission set, um, sort of given the sort of lack of maybe clear direction from the president um, on that mission, as well as the lack of consensus uh, on that mission from the Hill? Okay, I think I heard most of that. But um, I think in terms of the uh, uh, JTF Gitmo or the Gitmo question, um, uh, the thing is is that the, our mission is to provide the safe, legal, and humane treatment uh, of the de de detainees that are there. And so that's what our mission revolves around and all the other decisions uh, that are policy decisions, we just execute that mission and we execute it to the best of our ability and uh, make sure that it's the safe, humane, and legal treatment of, uh, of, those, detain of those detainees and those other decisions and, and um, discussions and uh, arguments and things like that. Uh, that is at the policy level. And yes, the gentleman right behind you. Thanks, David. Thanks, General. Kevin Barron from Defense One. I wonder, uh, going back to the immigration, uh, migration, border security question, walk us through some of the, the myths versus realities of the security threats that you see uh, from the, the entire chain of migration as we hear them in the public discourse versus as a security professional, as a COCOM commander, how you view them. And when you talk about, you also you've talked about a lot today of the, the non-military ways and investments that, that you can alleviate security concerns in, south, in the South. I've heard that for many years, for 20 years, from all of your predecessors in this, uh, that same role. But it doesn't seem to resonate, at least in Congress or maybe with the American people. How do you think you can maybe move the ball more than in the past to really push for you know, foreign, other kinds of foreign investment or U.S. Uh, government investment that's non-military to get to those same goals you're mentioning? Yeah, so thanks for that great question. And so um, I like to uh, just in, in terms of the, when I talk about the integrated deterrence, it's really, I look at that as all of the levers out there all of the uh, uh, elements of national power that we have in the United States to bring to bear, and that when we talk about um, you know, how we can help uh, different countries, for example, we have uh, agreements with academia, and you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Southcom has uh, agreements with academia, but uh, Global Fishing Watch, for example, if I talk about uh, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing, right, it takes three, three billion in revenue away from our partner nations. So if we have, if we're able to uh, see something from the domain awareness that we do have as a COCOM, 
and working with our academia and working with uh, Global Fishing Watch. So we have the, in the academia part, uh, University of Miami and Florida International University have agreements and we can expose this malign activity, right? Because people don't like to be exposed when they're, uh, when they're behaving uh, in ways they're not supposed to, right? I don't, we don't need the credit in Southcom, but we will certainly give that information either to our partner nations or to NGOs or, or through our academia uh, to get that message out there. When you talk about uh, insecurity and instability, right? $310 billion revenue business a year. It's off the charts. It's not just counter narcotics. It's human trafficking. It's illegal logging, illegal mining, uh, Ill, uh, IUU fishing. Uh, it is a whole host of things. And so um, this is, uh, it, it, in my mind, it creates the wedge, the insecurity and the instability that our uh, partner nation, uh, not our partner nations, but our adversaries capitalize upon. And, um, and then they flourish, right? And make that even a bigger wedge for them to be able to uh, undermine uh, US objectives, undermine our relationships, undermine uh, the objectives that we have in the region. You know, I talked earlier about the PRC is playing chess. Well, Russia is playing checkers, right? And they have uh, short-term goals in terms of undermining our democracy, uh, causing destabilization uh, through the information environment. Off the charts in this region, over 30 million followers in social media, Sputnik Mundo, uh, Russia Today Espanol, uh, very, very prevalent. We are not in competition in that space. We are in conflict in the information environment. And when I bring this up, some like, most of the countries are very, very aware of this. But making them stronger in order to be able to counter this. When I bring up dif disinformation, they'll say, oh, fake news. And I'm like, yeah, I, you could say that. But the, uh, you know, how do we band together in terms of all domains um, with our partner nations being stronger? It's not just in the information space. It's not just in the air domain or the, uh, the sea domain in terms of counter narcotics. I mean, it is the whole gamut. It's cyber. It's space. It's, uh, we have a lot of things to get after. And we have to work together as a team for our neighborhood. Um, I'm, the takeaway for me, we are not in competition, we are in conflict in the information space. Uh, I've been signaled that we've run out of time. I recognized a woman uh, who was standing in the back next to the pillar. Can you ask a brief question and we'll ask General Richardson to give a brief answer and then it's lunchtime. Thank you, thanks for your awareness and you're, in, you're so informative, General, um, and good questions, David. But my question is, is there a way to get a general honorary kind of guy in Latin America, uh, Central America, uh, where we can give more security? And there was a time American business got tax deductions to go to China. Well, is there a way to work something out like that and we can be less dependent on China? Well, last word. Can you raise your hand where you are? I, I, there we go, okay. I thought that might be you. Okay, uh, so in terms of working with the interagency, I, I would like to just um, let you know that we're, we are very much involved with the interagency. I think that we can do better, but we have to uh, continue to provide forums where we can collaborate. And so in May at Southcom, I, we hosted the, all of the chiefs of mission from this region uh, at Southcom. So we had the ambassadors and the charges Oh, by the way, we have 12 ambassadors that still need to get in the seat, so I would uh, appreciate your integrated deterrence and in helping to reinforce the priority of getting our uh, ambassadors in their seats. It's kind of like me not being here for Southcom and having an acting uh, or a deputy that's in my seat. Very, very important. But go back to the interagency. We, host, we had over 60 interagency uh, inter that were there at this, uh, at this conference that we held. And we had uh, commerce, we had treasury, we had justice. Um, and we hold a law enforcement working group as well. I have, I, uh, I think, about 15 interagency LNOs that work out of the Southcom headquarters already. And, uh, but when you're talking about the Ill, uh, illeg illegitimate uh, or the 
uh, money laundering uh, that takes place in our region as well. If I go back to the $310 billion business and money laundering and those kinds of really complex challenges, we have to continue to work collaboratively with the interagency to move the ball down the field. So I appreciate your question. Um, and, uh, and we'll continue to work uh, all of those angles and issues. So it is lunchtime. Uh, thanks to General Laura Richardson for a wonderful chance to talk about what we don't talk about enough.